Hello and welcome Hello, here, buddy. Uh, today I'll welcome Shonas, Emil, and Pierre to this talk, building a software makerspace with CloudStack. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe we can uh, change back to the to our control right now. And yeah, perfect. All right, welcome everyone. It's really nice to be here, and so nice to see so many familiar faces. Yeah, we will talk about how we created a software makerspace for student and research projects using CloudStack. And as this project was done at KDH, uh, Tech University at Sweden, it's arguably a bit different environment than many other talks here. And this came with its own challenges and hurdles, which we will talk about. But uh, first of all, a little bit more background. So as you saw before, that's Jonas, my, uh, my, my colleague. Uh, he's a professor at Sport Technology at KDH. Pierre and I are both master students of distributed systems at KDH. And we've been working on this project ever since our bachelor's thesis in 2021. Yeah, but as I mentioned, uh, this is all happening at KDH, a university, uh, a top tech university in uh, Sweden. So, uh, Jonas, Jonas can, you, can you hear us? You can change back to the Zoom again if you want. Cool. Uh, thank you. So, uh, my name is Jonas Voslien. Uh, I'm a teacher at KTH. Uh, and I'm going to show you, because I have an audience here as well. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, with all the students there as well. Uh, I'm going to click back to the HTML video. I kicked that one out. Uh, so, um, uh, did I kill the internet? I think so. I want to see myself now. Did I kill myself? You. Everything is fine. We, we can hear you. Okay, then I continue. So, um, uh, I was trying to see the program as well, but I'm, for some reason, I only see myself now. Uh, so, it becomes very strange here. Uh, there, I see you guys as well now. Perfect. Um, so, what I'm doing here is trying to teach students about uh, software development. So, the, the students you saw, behind me are uh, doing full stack development. And, and the PowerPoint you see there uh, is regarding our vision. Um, so the idea is that here we try to go from an ID to into reality. Uh, and uh, we have done that in a normal makerspace. So you have your ID, you do electronic circuits of it, and then you try to build something for real on it. Uh, but we realized that we really lack that part also in software. Uh, so our idea is to, to try to build kind of space that solves all of this from idea into concept in different areas. Uh, so uh, from now and on, we are refer ourselves as bracket spaces, and that could be anything. So it could be software or cloud spaces, which Pierre and Emil is going to talk about during the next of lectures. Uh, but it can also be the active space. So being in sports tech, what I'm doing, uh, we try to go from an idea of building a sensor and make it available for, for students uh, and into athletes. And in order to do that, we have a pre-validation uh, gym or space inside our building. So we can go there and try out our hardware on a thread mill, for example. Uh, we have the eye heel is one of the examples there is uh, we built our own mechanical heart. And with that heart, we are able to more or less get a complete system of how the blood flow is working in your body. Uh, and we have other these, like a pitch base, of course, that's the elevator, because you have an elevator pitch. Uh, we have entrepreneurship spaces, so we can get more people getting from an ID to a company. Um, we have cyberspace or software spaces where we can have access to hardware, which is you as a student may can't afford. So it can be HoloLenses that we have. Uh, I hope that we can get the Google Glass as soon as it arrives. Uh, Mac computers for those that has a Mac computer and so on. Um, so, so that is the idea of, of, of having this academic area that provides with, with the newest and coolest technologies uh, from, I would say, pure hardware to pure software. Um, if you need GPU power, that should be available for you. So you can have that understanding when you leave academia and, and try to make new businesses or new ideas out to the market. Uh, 
Uh, I could talk for this for, for many hours, uh, what we do, but I think that that's good enough for me. Uh, do you want me to add something, Emil, or Pierre? No, thank you, Jonas. That was, that was great. So we can swap back to the normal view. Perfect. Yeah, so for those of you that didn't see it through the very good quality of Zoom, <laughs> here is the slide. <laughs> um, but yeah, as Jonas talked about, uh, in a real maker space, we have tools. We have, uh, we have tools such as a PCB printer, a soldering station, or uh, even a 3D printer sometimes. And having the right tools, we, we really believe, is what enables a student to be creative and what to really embrace themselves, and most importantly, in a university environment, to learn, right? But these principles, as Jonas talked about, does not only apply to the traditional makerspaces, so what about us, the software engineers? Yeah, so uh, how can we realize this vision for uh, makerspaces for software engineers? So um, the current modern method of teaching uh, software engineering at KTH is that everything should be run on your laptop, uh, or you should use some uh, fancy hyperscale cloud like AWS. Um, but we all know that running on your laptop is not production ready, and uh, you can easily run out of AWS credits. Um, so why not uh, learn on a platform which is uh, free for students, it's uh, at the right skill level to make sure that um, you're not overwhelmed, uh, and it's also not going to uh, send you a bill at the end of the month. Uh, so we thought, how can we fix this? Uh, so we started by sort of uh, listening, uh, interviewing, looking at the workflows that the students and researchers had uh, before this. Uh, and so we arrived at the conclusion that uh, the students want a very simple deployment. Like uh, even something as trivial as dockerizing an uh, application can be very complicated uh, when it's the first time you do it. Uh, teachers, however, uh, they want you to learn everything uh, underneath, all the underlying layers. Uh, so how the, the data goes from the Intel CPU to the TikTok application on your phone. Um, and then researchers, they just want graphics card. Uh, so they don't care about how it works, they just want, you know, uh, PyTorch.cuda, uh, true. Uh, that's it. Um, and as uh, Wido talked about, I don't know if it's here, um, everybody wants sustainability. Uh, yet KTH uh, infrastructure discards a server after three years only. So we have a free supply of uh, servers uh, just internally. Uh, but so this is a tech conference, obviously. So um, what exactly have we built, and how are we integrating CloudSec? Um, so you can see, sort of, in the spirit of keeping it simple, uh, because we're a very small team, uh, we just use a very simple stack using canonical MOS, uh, sort of or orchestrating the host, uh, the CSAPI, just uh, logging our host and keeping all the information, and then uh, CloudSec is the orchestrator for our Kubernetes cluster, KVM, uh, graphics card, and uh, then we have since. Uh, collaboration conference last year, um, where we had a heard a talk about uh, that you should build your own front end uh, for CloudStack. We sort of noticed that the, the CloudStack uh, GUI, while it's uh, very impressive for a sysadmin, uh, for an end user it's a bit complicated. Uh, so we've been hard at work uh, building our own uh, sort of front end. Um, and so you can see something that's been a recurring theme. I think uh, stuff from Wii Systems. You talked about this in your presentation, right? Uh, GPUs. It's very uh, sort of, it's a big thing in, in uh, CloudSec because it's not really natively supported unless you use this uh, grid card uh, mixed with send server. Uh, so the way we did this is just using our sysAPI. We fetched the like bus ID and the function uh, for the actual graphics card. And then uh, we exposed this to the user. So you can just um, you know, select your graphics card, click lease, and don't worry about it. Uh, and then we just put this uh, KVM extra config XML uh, into the virtual machine, and CloudStack just uh, does the rest. So the question, why are we here? <laughs> right. Uh, we compared a few alternatives before deciding uh, what we should base this entire project on. And as many other talks we heard uh, yesterday, many of you uh, also were you know, starting out with OpenStack and maybe even Open Nebula, and so did we. Uh, but we ended up with CloudStack due to its, uh, because of how well it ran old, old hardware. Because as Pierre said, we had a lot of old hardware run, lying around from old IT projects and so on. And that's an important point to make because uh, when we're building this private cloud in a public sector, it can be really tough to find funding. Um, we don't really have a big budget, especially not in the beginning. So using old hardware might be the only option a university have. 
And you know, let's be real, <laughs> uh, delivering top of the line performance is not really necessary when the end goal is to create a learning environment. But of course, there were other benefits with CloudStack, such as easy documentation, really easy to spin up a proof of concept, and of course, a strong community. But what are the results then? Well, from a student perspective, as Pierre showed, this is all a available platform offering free hosting for the students. But in fact, a few courses at KDH have already adopted this um, as a way of enabling students to learn how to deploy a web application as you would in the real world. Because as Jonas talked about before, and as Pierre said as well, doing this on your local computer is, is very different from doing, scaling it up on the server side. And just giving the students the tools to to learn how you would do that on the server side can be really helpful. Um, we also encourage some ambitious students to really delve themselves into this project, see what's going on behind the scenes, maybe even start to maintain the cloud and develop it further, essentially making it a cloud run by students, for students, because after all, two years ago, those two ambitious students were Pierre and I. Uh, so enough about students. Uh, researchers are uh, just as important in KTH. Uh, and they also bring all of the budget uh, when we want to buy new stuff, like a graphics card, for example, or usually paid by uh, EU grants uh, and other sort of uh, trust. Um, so we, we realized that we have to make something better than the existing solution of just having a big um, com desktop computer under your desk. Uh, and this is quite dif difficult, obviously. It's always available, it's always on, uh, it's always close to you. Um, but so what, what we sort of enable is by, by collaborating and using these resources together, um, we, we allow researchers to use much more powerful graphics card like uh, A6000 compared to what they might have in their uh, desktop already. Um, and we have to tailor this uh, very much so they, they can use um, Jupyter, MATLAB, uh, Neo4j, for example, uh, and just plug it in straight to their uh, Python script. Um, so ensure they have an easy experience. Right, so the fun part of what was hard with this project, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, since this is a uh, university environment, we obviously have some unique issues. Uh, because when, in the end, when building a private cloud in a public sector, um, there are always, uh, obviously some other hustles that you don't encounter when you do it in a company, for example. So communication with other departments is, you know, can be, can be slower at the public sector, like in a university, with IT and sysadmins and so on. So integrating SSO or buying hardware um, can be re really time consuming. But it also applies for software, which uh, brings me to my next point of proprietary software. Because when we built this project, it was important for us to just base it on free and open source software, you know, to, to make, uh, you know, the, the development uh, uh, really easy in the future. Uh, and it could be really difficult to find alternatives to proprietary software. I mean, that's true for all projects that's open source, but many nice, to have t n many nice to have tools were often behind a hefty license. I mean, this is especially true for NVIDIA, who is not really interested in a budget solution. I think we all have <laughs> that experience with NVIDIA. They don't want you to build it yourself. They want to sell you some expensive AI tooling and so on. So it was difficult for us to acquire the top-of-the-line GPUs and the software that comes with it. But the last part is probably more applicable just for us, uh, and it's to make people use our system. Because the software makerspace is not really a, uh, a commonly used term, like uh, traditional makerspaces. And we don't have a marketing, marketing team dedicated to fix this. Um, so we had to be creative. We really had to try to get researchers and teachers to use this in, our pro in their projects and their, their courses. Uh, luckily, we had one course uh, that used already, that used this platform. But you know, after all, free web hosting, free virtual machines, free GPUs is a pretty nice offer. So what are the next steps? We are not done yet, right? Um, so we would really like to extend this to more campuses around KDH. Uh, we are pretty, pretty uh, localized right now in one campus at KDH. Maybe even other universities. It could be really awesome, because in the end, it was nothing special about KDH that made it possible, uh, apart from you know, being lucky of having the right people to talk to and having access to servers and so on. Uh, but we'd really, really like to extend this to more places. IPv6 is, uh, is a thing that we don't really support right now, and we really believe that this could be useful for network courses, courses and so on, so not just server development. Um, and maybe even extend this to allow computing of sensitive data. We have a lot of contact with hospitals, so acquiring sensitive patient data from hospitals and doing some computation on that to support the entire pipeline of this, and even federated learning, that could be awesome. But right now we have some more um, 
urgent issues as Pierre and I are soon retiring from the universities, <laughs> heading out in the real world. <laughs> and we need to transfer the knowledge um, that we gathered over the last two years uh, to any other maintainer, be it a student, researcher, or a teacher even. Because after all, if we would use uh, another student to maintain this, then we need to factor in that they need a baseline to, to, be, a, to be able to maintain this. And once they have that baseline, they might not have that much time left in their program. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't hire someone if you only knew they would work for like half a year, right? Uh, so, enough about us. Uh, since we're at the Klausek Lab, uh, we're, uh, we, we have some wishes for Klausek. Uh, sort of wishes for Santa, but it's uh, Klausek instead. Uh, so, obviously, GPU support. Uh, I think there's already some talks about it uh, going on at the drinks yesterday, so uh, maybe we'll see this uh, become a reality. And um, we also noticed the CKS um, doesn't allow for custom templates uh, for the, the nodes uh, building the CKS cluster. So for example, if you want to configure the API server uh, of kubectl, uh, this can be a bit uh, tricky without your own template. Uh, and also we love uh, Rancher, uh, also open source. Um, so we'd love to see it better integrated with CloudSec to see um, when, when you're creating a cluster or adding nodes to just, uh, just works. Uh, but so, um, as we said, everything is open source. Uh, so if you want to look at the code or um, try and deploy some virtual machines, we have a test account. So you can uh, mine some bitcoins or whatever you like to do. <laughs> That's up to you. Yeah. Yes, uh, but as Rohit said yesterday, CloudSec is sort of like in this enabler. But this, as this product has shown, it does not only enable uh, ideas for companies and organizations. It's, it, it enables education. And maybe this is the education of the future. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, to the room, uh, any question? Lucian? Yes, uh, two questions. So first of all, what kind of zone are you running? Or maybe you're running more of than one? Uh, what type? And uh, second, uh, you talked about transfer of uh, knowledge as you two are going, uh, living the nest or whatever, and um, uh, are there any like practical plans on how to get uh, other students uh, you know, learn about uh, CloudStack and... Uh... Uh, I can take the first question. Uh, we are currently only localized, so we have one zone. It's an advanced zone in CloudStack. It's nothing... Nothing too fancy about it. We try to be as simple as possible because in the end, we, we need other students to, so, to use this. So is it a security group zone uh, or is it an advanced zone, a regular advanced zone? Uh, it's an advanced zone. We don't it's use security groups. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so as we said, we might add some more campuses. So we have uh, one more zone, actually, which is sort of in, uh, in construction right now. Uh, but so it's, it really fits our use case, just spinning up nodes and um, in clusters, in pods, and the whole stack. Uh, but as so you said, the uh, knowledge transfer, uh, I think this is, you know, any open source product or any sort of community-based uh, effort is always going to have this issue of transferring knowledge from um, the, the people who created it to the people who maintain it. Um, and so our sort of solution has been, um, you know, uh, open like a chat room and also like a, a wiki, uh, just trying to document as much as possible. Uh, and wherever possible, we don't build ourselves. We just use, you know, CloudStack or some other tool like Rancher. Um, because you guys have great documentation already, so we can just point that, uh, you know, this is how you do it, um, and, and let them figure it out. Thank you. You mentioned uh, uh, custom UI for users. Uh, is there any plan to integrate that back into CloudStack, or is it not possible, not usable? Uh, well, we, we obviously keep CloudStack for the sort of specialized use cases. Uh, otherwise, we could have used TikTok frontend and some KVM low-level application if we want to spin up some virtual machines. But uh, I, be I think CloudStack can really uh, be the next step for students that want to take it to the sort of, uh, you know, want to delve themselves in. But I don't think we will, in the foreseeable future, we will not implement CloudStack for the normal student to use it now. I think you were asking about merging our front end to the upstream. Yes. Yeah, I think it might be difficult because we, we've really sort of targeted it um, through our own API, which sort of, uh, is a layer on top of CloudSec. Um, but if you, if you like any features, you can uh, <laughs> tag me in the issue. There's an update to the UI in, in the upcoming version, so I was wondering how much 
it is like it's also more user friendly for end users. Yeah, we have um, we have one thing in common: is the global create button. It's very nice. <laughs> Great. Any more questions? Hi guys, this is brilliant to see. I, I love it. It's fantastic. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what we as a community could could do if what we could do any more to make it you know easier for guys like you and and also you know you're talking about knowledge transfer when you move on into to the big wide world you know is, is there a way do you think that we could uh, get it where it's, it becomes just you know much much easier for academic organizations to access the community uh, to get the understanding because obviously your users are writing code but we as a project, we really love your users to sort of go under the hood and, and, and start to have a look at how, how this all hangs together. So interested to hear your views on that. Mm, yeah, I think in the beginning we were obviously the students learning CloudSec as well. And if anyone would go in to maintain this project, that would be us, but two years ago. Um, and the, I guess the difficulties we faced uh, back, in, back in those days were, you know, even though CloudSec was easy to set up, I think uh, being a bit more transparent with the guides maybe to set it up. We were reliant sort of on the Rohit's uh, guides on the Raspberry Pi. They were awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, um, I guess the documentation on the website could explain more like what some features are because in the end when you learn you need to have a clear you know, line what some things are. I, I have a lot of examples where <laughs> when, you, uh, when you look at the information button and it just says the name of the thing that you were trying to look up. You know, small things like that could really help learning because always referring to the wiki and back and so forth can be, can be uh, time consuming. Yeah, anything, anything else? No, no. No, but we believe this has been an awesome platform to create this entire project on. Yeah. Guys, one question from the online session from Joseph. What backup solutions you use? Just secondary storage? Yeah, we do um, backup with our uh, storage solution. So we have uh, NFS. Uh, we use like this TrueNAS. Um, so we just do uh, backup through, through there. We also had some contact with another IT department that said we can uh, connect this to KDH uh, backup in their IT systems because they have a lot of storage that we can use. Because in the end, we don't use that much storage for, uh, we don't store that much data, so it wouldn't be too much of an issue. So normally, university has an IT department that has a storage solution, and you can probably opt in to use that. And, yeah. Yeah. Tape backup. <laughs> they have tape. <laughs> tape backup. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Any more questions from the room? Uh, for the GPU, are you guys using vGPUs with NVIDIA license or? Uh, no, uh, no um, we, we tried um, because I think the 6000 supports vGPU. Uh, we tried getting a license uh, and we spoke to probably five, six, seven salesmen. You know, we ended up with an engineer back to a salesman. Uh, we never figured it out. Um, and okay. also, since we had sort of issues with integrating it in CloudStack, I think we sort of decided that just passing it through was, was going to be the easier part. Okay. Uh, we also had a lot of old computers and even uh, desktop PCs that we tried to integrate uh, the resources for. And that could be just a consumer-grade uh, GPU, which yeah. does not support vGPU anyway. So we had to support non-vGPU uh, workflows as well. So we based this, and then we'll see what we'll do in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the room? I guess that's all. Thank you, guys. Thank you.